Our next presenter is Hinek Slavak. He's developer in Vario Media. Thank you. Hello, hello. So first of all, I would like to thank everyone who actually did what I asked to and came uh, to the front rows. Thank you so much for uh, humoring me. Um, I have also to apologize. I'm a bit um, physically inconvenienced because I managed to kind of get a blockade in my neck yesterday when, while doing my hair. So <laughs> if you ever wonder how it is to get old, it's not gray hair. It's not being able to do your morning stuff without hurting yourself. If you're local and you know some <laughs> physiotherapist who could uh, like deblock my neck, please come and talk to me <laughs> after this talk. <laughs> so, other than that, uh, some may or may not know me. I work at a small web hosting company called Vary Media, and I want to teach you how numbers and colorful graphs can improve your life and the life of those that are impacted if you get paged out of bed at 4 a.m. And my clicker is not attached. So, concretely, I want you by the end of the talk to be able, I'm not good at multitasking, please, one minute. <laughs> so, so, I want you by, this, by the end of the talk to be able to predict performance problems. Because if you can prevent them, or if you can just stomp out a little blaze, it's so much better than having to fight a huge operations fire. If something happens anyway, I want you to be alerted by your system with useful data and not by your hysterical boss on, um, on Slack or by your very angry customers on the phone. And if a fire is burning, I don't want you to stare at a, a useless top output hoping to come with some inspiration while your boss is still poking their finger into your back. I want you to have data about your systems uh, right at hand. And of course, in a meaningful format. And that also includes historic development, because once you run into a fire, you want to know how you, get, how you got there, especially because the cycles should feed back. Once something happens, you want to be alerted the next time, and ideally, you want to prevent it. So, if you want to reason about situations like this is good, this is bad, this is really bad, uh, you need an objective representation for these situations. And um, for that, you can express the quality of the level of your service. So you may have already seen those words, usually with a third different word. And so first you need an indicator, which can be the request latency or the uptime something like that. Once you have an indicator, so you have something to talk about, you can formulate service level objectives, which can be latency must be always under 100 milliseconds, uh, you have to have five nines uptime, things like these. And then finally, the probably most famous one, once you have objectives, you can formulate contracts and agreements on top of those numbers, because what will happen if those objectives are missed? Are we gonna sue you? Are we gonna cancel our contract? Now, agreements are not part of this talk, but SLIs and SLOs are. Because SLIs are just metrics, and SLOs are conditions you want to fulfill. In other words, you want to get alerted if you are not fulfilling them. So one step back, what are metrics? Metrics are numbers or samples in a database. They are time-stamped, which makes them a time series. And you're gonna have to have a lot of time series, which means that you can correlate them. For example, in this example, your request latency with your server load, a very typical use case. Now you get those uh, time series by adding instruments to your system. And a system can mean anything. It can be your app or it can be a server. It's just like on a car or on a plane, except that these instruments now get hooked up to a time series database that will store them. And then depending on what time, a time series database you're using, it will allow you to do queries and operations on top of them. Now, you have to obviously instrument your app. Next, next up is probably some dependencies like uh, your database, your web server, your load balancer. They all carry very an, uh, important and useful information for you to correlate with your application data. Then, of course, your environment, your server load, your memory, your I.O. activity. And finally, 
And that's kind of underappreciated, I think. You can also instrument your business, like the number of your customers, the number of your paying customers. I mean, we are not in San Francisco, so the numbers are more, more similar here, but still. Or your daily revenue. So seeing a graph that correlates your front end latency with your sign-up rates or your uh, revenue can be enlightening sometimes, especially if you are um, arguing with your boss about whether, whether or not you need that SSD. Now, nothing of this is new. People have been doing this for years. I've been doing this for years. Actually, I've been talking about this last year just here. Um, but in the past, you had to choose multiple components with various, tr various trade-offs. And most notably, they aren't integrated. And this is a bad situation to be in if you wake up one morning and say, OK, I want to, to have metrics. What do I do? And now, now you have to learn basically everything and then choose what you want to use. And others, like StatsD, they have some really, really bad properties, but you don't realize that until the fire is burning. So I find that Prometheus is different, and that's because it gives you a well-rounded and opinionated metrics and monitoring system, which is integrated. It's absolutely flexible, but it has a proven and well-documented starting point. So opinions are a dime a dozen, obviously, but in this case, it's okay to listen because it's more or less a re-implementation of Google's internal monitoring system that has been implemented by ex-Googlers working, in that case, at SoundCloud, and they were just missing their pet uh, monitoring system. So to give you an idea how it works, let's have an architecture walk. Core feature, of course, uh, is the storage of time series. Now, a time series is really just a named stream of float samples with timestamps. Stamp, uh, time That's all. But Prometheus wants you to think in uh, terms of four types that are built on, on top of these uh, streams. So first, there are counters, which are for counting events or counting anything. Uh, the important property is that counters can only increase, but they can increase by anything. So you can use them to measure your network traffic or to count your, to your errors, whatever. If you need to set arbitrary numbers, a gauge is for you. A gauge is for exposing numbers, and it can be set to anything, so it's used for things like server load, temperatures, or the number of active requests right now. And these two are pretty obvious, how they map on a timestamp float stream, but the others are more interesting. So a summary takes measurements so it observes measurements and allows you to compute the rate they come in, like requests per second, and the average measurement, like the average request time. Now, some clients, and Python is explicitly not one of them, also allow you to define percentiles, which are then computed within the app. The reason why it's not in there is that it's not really useful, because you cannot aggregate meaningfully percentiles. It's, it's just not how math works. So. Uh, Instead, uh, you should use histograms, and that's like the, um, the working horse of, of metrics in this case. It's also about observing values, and you keep track of averages. But additionally, you define buckets. And these buckets uh, should have the typical sizes uh, of the values we are measuring, and then Prometheus can estimate percentiles server-side from these buckets. It also means that you are not uh, deriving numbers in your application while it's serving some important requests. That's a very nice uh, property. Now, I said percentiles twice now, which is because they are very important. So I'll give you a quick rundown so just you're on the same page. And it starts with the premise that averages are probably less useful than you may think. And to have something concrete to talk about, uh, let's assume we measure request latencies. And I think it's fair to say that request latencies are a good indicator of the quality of a service. Fast requests are good, slow requests are bad. It doesn't matter if it's a web page or it's an API. In any case, you want it to be fast. Now, the average time is not the average user experience in this case. Because let's look at this example. Uh, no user is experiencing a latency of 2.8 in this point. Um, so not only is, is it not the correct answer, it's also um, muddling all numbers together, and you, you, don't, you don't see that one request is really, really bad while the others are just fine. 
And the problem here is that there are no bell curves in production. It's uh, every, each production data you will encounter in your life, it's skewed in some way. So, um, yeah, and that means basically you, you may be wasting your time on optimizing a perfectly good average case while there is just some outlier for some reason and you will not, you will not ever find it if you do not know that it's an outlier. So, uh, what is the average experience, or what does the average user experience here? It's one. And if you remember high school, there is a function that will, would have told you. So it's a median, which takes a sorted data set and gives you the middle value or the average of the two middle values if it's an even order, uh, even size set. <clears throat> now, uh, the median strength in representing the average user in this case is also, also its biggest uh, weakness because this still returns one. And I think we can all uh, just agree that this is not a useful information to receive. So, but fortunately, where the median comes from, there's more. And this brings us back to the percentiles. They also partition a sorted data set, but this time into 100 parts. And then you look at the nth value for the nth percentile. Or <clears throat> the nth percentile p is the upper limit of n percent of data set values, which sounds super confusing, but it just means the following. If the 50th percentile is one millisecond, then it means that by one millisecond, 50% of your requests are done. That's all that it means. And if you think about it, that's actually our median again, which again is not useful by itself, but we can go further. We now have a parameter that we can tweak. So let's look how long the 95% 95, 95 of our fastest requests took. And we see we have a problem. Something is very, very wrong. And something between 50 and 5% of our users are affected by this. So at this point, you can uh, drill deeper because, as said before, Prometheus is computing its percentile server side, so they are not fixed. You can always look, uh, try to find others. And yeah, with an average, you wouldn't have uh, gotten any useful either. You would just think that all take forever. Now, the problem with percentiles, and not a lot of people uh, talk about that, is that they throw away most of the data. And that's a problem if you want a representation of your service health or your service quality. So in the end, you still need the average to have, to have a number that is, distills everything and doesn't just look at certain values. So now that we have the math out of the way, let's talk about naming. Anybody who ever used graphite or together with StatC, they will have seen something like that. Uh, they put the metadata into the metric name which is kind of annoying. So any modern TSDB, and Prometheus is one of them, switched to bare names. So the best practice here is to prepend it with an app name, which is not a good app name. It's just a short app name, so I can use a big font on my slides. Um, and to append a unit. A total is a counter. If you are measuring times, you would have the seconds or something like that. So it's a bit uh, self-explaining. Now, this metadata is added using so-called labels, which, which looks like this. And each new label combination still adds a new time series, or how they call it, a dimension. Um, so that means that you do not get less time series, but it's much more readable, it's structured. So you can uh, do much, you can do uh, aggregation, um, aggregations on it in a much nicer way, like formulate queries on label values. It's, it's really nice. Now, how do you get those values? And that's where it gets kind of uh, interesting, because contrary to, to the most metric system, Prometheus is pool-based, which means that each instrumented system exports its metrics via HTTP, and Prometheus scrapes them for you. So if I'm using the metaphor from before, you add instruments to a system, and Prometheus looks at it regularly, writes them down as a timestamp, and is done. This means a lot of things. So first of all, you can adjust the resolution of each single target by configuring how often the metrics are scraped. So if you want more frequent scrapes, you get more precise data, but it uses more uh, disk space. It's always a trade-off. It also means that if scrapes fail for some reason, like, say, a high load, you don't lose data or meaning. You just lose resolution. 
which is kind of important because your average rates still make sense. Compare that to a push-based approach where lost samples actually mean that your rate is sinking. So it looks like things are going down, although it's rising beyond the capacity of your system to report metrics. And this makes uh, Prometheus really, really great for um, monitoring. But it's a bad fit for things if you want, like accounting. That's a common question on the mailing list. You do not get the single values, like the single request times. You just get averages out of it and can do useful data on it. But it's not an accounting or a accounting system. So then you have to go for something like Postgres or InfluxDB if you need each single number. Now, um, there's a few problems too, of course. So one is short-lived jobs, like your backup script. You're not going to uh, convert your cron script into, into web services just so someone can script metrics. And there's an official solution for that. It's called the push gateway, which will receive the data from your short-lived script, and it retains them for Prometheus to scrape. Problem solved. Then there's, of course, the problem of target discovery. If you want to scrape something, you have to know that it actually exists. Um, some people consider this a problem, but it's actually just moved the problem of knowing what your production systems are from monitoring into your metric system. Because Nagios also needs to know about all your systems. So you're not getting around about telling some system about your systems. And you can do it either by configuration. This will tell Prometheus to scrape itself. So it gives you the number of time series and your buffer usage. Um, this is uh, an exporter, a target, or an instance. It means all the same. And a group of those together are so-called job. So for example, if you have multiple Prometheus servers, you could uh, scrape them all there. Or if you have multiple backends of the same web service, they are one job but multiple instances. And now, these two values you get automatically for each scraped metric as labels. So you can do filtering on top of this and aggregation. So in practice, of course, you're not going to do static configuration. You will use some kind of service discovery. We personally use Consul. It works great. But uh, people have been using it with other systems very successfully either. Now, there's one final problem, and this is actually a problem, and that is um, closed or netted or load balance systems like Heroku or end user appliances that run in a, in a local network of a customer. Because you cannot expose things really, and if you do, people may get really mad at you. So in the case of Heroku, there have been talks about an official plugin. As far as I know, there's nothing concrete yet. And other than that, there's no really good solution. Prometheus is not a good fit for this. Generally speaking, Prometheus is intended to run in the same network as its targets. If you cannot do that, you probably have to look elsewhere. So, but there's a lot of advantages too. So first, high availability is super easy. You just run multiple Prometheus servers and point them at the same uh, exporters, done. And this also means that you can have production data in your test environment. So for example, we had an intern and we wanted to make him work on our metric system. So we, we never ha had him uh, touch our production Prometheus. But he had a Prometheus on his notebook and he got access to the metrics endpoints of the systems that were relevant to his work and he could do everything he needed. That's a very nice uh, property. Then um, outage detection is really easy. If scrape fail, you know something's fishy. Uh, reasoning about how long you didn't hear from a system, so it's probably that, is possible, but uh, more complicated. What I personally like is the predictable effect on the infrastructure, because more traffic does not mean more metric traffic. It's always the same. You said once how often you want to, be, uh, to scrape your data, and that's it which also means that it does not congest an already busy network if something is going on in your system. And finally, it means that instrumenting third parties is pretty easy, actually, because any production-ready system has some kind of instruments that it exposes to its users. So any database has a special table with performance metrics. Web servers have their status pages. Java has its JMX. Now you just have to take these metrics and transform them into something that Prometheus understands. And it turns out what Prometheus understands is pretty easy for you to understand too. So let's look how it looks like. 
This is what an exporter exports. It's, there's always at least the option of the human readable format. And in this case, it is the first part of a histogram about request latencies. Again, very bad metric name, short metric name for a big font. Mm. Now, this is the first one, which is um, the first part of it. And this time series uh, is the number of measurements that have been observed. So how many requests did we observe? And the second one is the sum of the measured times, like the total time observed. So in this case, we had 390 requests that altogether took 177 point something um, seconds. And this is super cheap to keep track of. We're just adding float numbers. And these are also literally the samples that uh, Prometheus stores if you're using the, um, the, the summary uh, type in Python. This is all you get. So to get percentiles, as I've said, you also need buckets. And they look like this. In this case, we have six buckets. The LE label gives you the upper limit that the, um, that the sample has to fit into. It trickles down, so something that fits into 0 0.5 also, points into, uh, also fits into 2.0. This is the number of samples that uh, fit into this bucket. Now, Prometheus can interpolate percentiles from this. And that's good enough in practice. And you can always increase the precision of your percentiles by adding more buckets. But you have to make sure that your values distribute evenly over your buckets, or distribute at all. Because if all values are just in one bucket, Prometheus cannot uh, compute anything meaningful out of it. So please define your buckets based on the latencies you have, not the latencies you would like to have, because that's not useful. So we have metrics in a database. What do we do with them? We query them. And for that, we use the Prometheus query language called PromQL. And I don't have enough time to give you a proper intro. And there's like really amazing stuff uh, going on. You can implement a game of life in it. But well, I give you a few examples. So you, have, you will usually have a lot of related uh, time series that you want to aggregate to, to one or to a few. Uh, so for example, say you have many backends in multiple data centers. And you want a total request rate over all backends. So we will work ourselves from the inside out. Here's the counter again, which you saw on the slide before. And to compute the rate, the function needs a so-called range vector. So this means, uh, this returns a vector or an array of values of the past one minute. How many that are depends on the, on the granularity of your data, so how often you scraped your targets in the one minute. And the rate function will compute the rate how fast is this, uh, is this counter rising? And um, at that point, you have the request rate for every single backend in every single data center. And now you just sum them up, and you have one value, you know, the total request rate over everything. Now, what if you want to know the rate of the backends in one data center? Then you just add a filter which looks like this. And here you can see how nice it works if you have labels that are structured instead of uh, having to uh, work with the dot separated names. Um, the rest is all the same. Now, if you want to have the request rate for each data center, but uh, broken down by data center, you, you drop the filter again, and you tell the sum function to retain the DC label. So in this case, you get as many rates as you have DCs. Simple. Now, what else is interesting? Percentiles, of course. And Prometheus uses so-called fee quantiles, which completely oversimplified are percentiles divided by 100. So this is the 90th percentile. And we take the rate of the buckets we just saw before. And histogram quantile will do the rest. We so, of course, this gives us um, as many uh, histograms as you have data, uh, as you have um, label combinations. So you may, want to have to, uh, you may want to aggregate it. But other than that, we have our uh, percentiles that we always wanted to have. 
Nice. So I hope you have somewhat of a taste how powerful PromQL is. And then it is used by all its consumers, which most notably are visualizations. So there's the internal one, which is not pretty, but at least it's not XJS. It's nice for playing around, drilling in, so something's going on, let's quickly look, or what could it be? And then you use the query elsewhere. Um, it's a bit limited because it has only one expression per graph, so you cannot do any correlations whatsoever. But you can build dashboards with Go templates if that's your thing, but it's not mine. So, PromDash has still the best integration because it used to be the former official visualization thingy, but it's deprecated now because Grafana has merged official Prometheus support, so it's deprecated, don't bother, go for the real thing. I think everyone who ever saw Grafana, I, I think a good measure of people are in this room just to find out how to use Grafana or what to do, because it's the best and best looking dashboard software right now. It has many, many integrations. You can build dashboards from different sources. So you can introduce Prometheus and still keep your InfluxDB or Graphite and integrate them in one dashboard, which is really nice. Especially because it gives you a step-by-step -step introduction. So uh, yeah, use this. There's no reason to use anything else. The final piece of the puzzle is alerting. And you can use PromQL to formulate alert conditions. And Prometheus then will push them into a separate daemon called the alert manager. So again, example time. And let's talk about monitoring for full disks. Because once a disk is full, it's too late. But alerting on some random threshold can lead to noise, which leads to alarm fatigue. So let's use a crystal ball to be notified in time without noise. And for that, we want an alert that fires when a disk is going to be full in four hours. And this is our crystal ball. It's, not, it's more high school mathematics, and it's called linear regression. So in this case, if given the samples of the past one hour, the disk will have less than zero capacity in four hours, and the condition is true for five minutes, so a small spike doesn't just uh, fire off some alerts, then we want to be alerted. How do we want to alert it? Again, it's completely plugable. It integrates with a lot of notification backends, of course, email, pager duty, webhooks. So yes, you can have Slack. So how do you get this web scale, which is, I promise, the really final part? The answer is federation. Prometheus servers can get their data from other Prometheus servers. And the typical use cases are aggregation, which can mean that you have one Prometheus server per data center, or one per team, or one per type. And then you aggregate all this data from these Prometheus servers into one big. Or for downsampling, say you have one really, really fast with SSD server, which is scraping all your targets, and you have high resolution data, which you want for monitoring, say. But you also want to save some history of your data, how your servers um, behaved over the years. So, in this case, you would just sample it down to a lower resolution for long-term storage by a second server, which has slow disks but big disks, and yeah, that's all there is to, this, to it. So you should have a general idea how Prometheus works now, so let's look how to get data into it. And there's a lot we can do without touching your code, so let's, let's, let's start without breaking things. And Prometheus has been uh, public for over a year. It has a very active ecosystem. Uh, the 1.0, by the way, uh, has been released, I think, this week. And I've already pointed out that it's easy to write uh, exporters for third-party things. And that's the reason why there are so many already. And it includes bridges, which is really cool, because it means that you can use your existing instrumentation pointed at these, uh, at these exporters, and they will transform whatever you are doing right now into Prometheus format, and Prometheus can give you the nice alerting and graphing and whatnot. So, native is better though, so let's start with platforms. First, fully featured servers. There's the official node exporter. that It will instrument your uh, servers from the inside, like Metal, KVM, LXT. Now, you know what picture comes next? One process containers. 
they like Docker, of course. Uh, they are instrumented from the outside using container APIs, and uh, it's called C Advisor. It's not Prometheus specific, and I believe it's from Google. So depending on how you run your system, de uh, decide. And installing such a daemon gives you full system insight. You get statistics about CPU, memory, network, I.O., and much, much more. And this is super useful if you, want to put, if you want to put your own metrics into context. So installation of these should be an automatic part of provisioning new servers and not something you have to remember or only do when you think about it. Then uh, another non-intrusive method is mtail. mtail will follow any log file and it will compute metrics on the fly based on regular expressions. That's very powerful. And in some cases, like the Apache web server, you even get better metrics if you set a custom log format and uh, use certain regular expressions to extract them. It's better than the status page that uh, it's serving. So you should definitely look, check it out. Mm. Now, no matter whether status pages or log files, you should always instrument the outer edge of your infrastructure, which usually is some web server or better uh, uh, something like an HA proxy, a little balancer. Now, if you look from the outside, there are also black box exporters. So think ping them just for free. They will probe your system using HTTP, TCP, or even ICMP, aka ping. But they add additional load, which nothing of what we've talked before really does. Then again, databases. Every database, even Mongo, has some, uh, some way to get uh, data out of it. Use it. And if you run your own infrastructure, there's also an SNMP uh, exporter. So at this point, we have already detailed information about your, our platform. We know how to look at your app from the outside by analyzing logs or even probing it. And we know how or that we can instrument third-party dependencies. So assuming you instrument your web server, you can already correlate request times with platform metrics like, like the server load and dependency metrics like what the hell is going on in your Postgres. This is good, but we need to deep, uh, drill deeper. And for that, oh, sorry, I forgot clicking. I'm so excited. So we have to touch your code. There it is. And to make things interesting, we'll use an example. And since it's a computer conference, example involves cats. So let's assume you've built a groundbreaking product, software that determines whether a photo contains a cat. So. Now, you need to deploy it as an HTTP service where the user posts a picture and you reply with a meow or a nope depending on what the picture contains. So, how hard can that be? Let's build a Flask web service. And you don't need to know really know Flask uh, to understand this. You just check authentication which, because your colleagues read Hacker News, is a microservice written in Go deployed on Docker. And you have an expensive computation that does the actual business logic, which the important fact is is a cat. Now, I bet lots of you have already written APIs like this. It's really fast. It's really cheap. Now, let's instrument it. And for that, we use the official Prometheus client package. And even before we change code, we do the least we can do. We just start the HTTP endpoint, which then runs in a separate thread. Why? Because on Linux, you get process statistics for free immediately. And that includes your memory usage, your, uh, the timestamp uh, of uh, when your uh, process started, your CPU time, the number of open files, and the maximum number of open files. So without changing a line of, line of code, really, you can already detect memory and file handle leaks, which happen, and they are really painful when your server just stops accepting connections and you don't know why. And you can monitor whether we approach the FT system limit. Nice. But let's start instrumenting. And for that, we define some metrics. First, a histogram that uh, measures our request latency. Then a histogram that looks how long the actual an analysis takes. And finally, a gauge that will tell us how many requests are active right now. And now we add them to the app. So we just 
add these two uh, decorators that do exactly what they sound like. The one tracks how many uh, function calls are in progress, which is how many um, views are in progress, and the other one measures the time that, are spe that, are spe that is spent in this function. Now, you might be saying that middleware would be much better because then you can have labels with the view name and a status code, and you'd be completely right. Please do that. I do that, but uh, Werkzeug middleware is a bit out of scope here. So, additionally, we measure the time. Come on, we, me we measure the time to analyze, because for all we know, all the time sinks into authentication, which in turn is not instrumented, at least ostensibly so. And that is because I've decided to make it a shared package, and you should instrument the package itself. Because if you use some uh, package 10 times, why should you instrument it 10 times? So again, we define a metric with the time spent, and one for errors. And that's especially because, as I've said, it's a microservice, which makes it a distributed system, which makes it fail in the most inconvenient ways in the most inconvenient time. So you have to look out for that. So whenever we fail, we increment the error, and um, yeah, we try again. And I'm aware that this is not how you retry in a distributed system. So if the rate goes up, you have a problem, and a big problem. But we also uh, um, count the invalid login login attempts, because they are a red flag too, because either you may be under attack, or you have some subtle failure in your authentication server, which manifests itself as wrong credentials, but actually just means that someone changed the data format or something. Now, these metrics have the same name in every app you use them, and you differentiate them using the, the job label. So, if done properly, which means you instrument your shared libraries, you put web-related metrics into middleware or even into your whiskey container because both G-Unicorn and uh, especially MicroWhiskey offer a lot of possibilities to hook in, in into them, you're left with one extra line in your view, which is both tolerable and I really think we should not be ashamed, feel ashamed about instrumentation. I'm kind of allergic to having a lot of instrumentation that repeats itself in your code and it, looks, it pollutes everything. And you should totally uh, try to pull things out into decorators and uh, middlewares. But in the end, any serious uh, production software has instrumentation. Anything that you connect to with your, uh, with your app, web apps or whatever you are writing. So do it too. Nobody ever regretted to have too much information uh, if things go sideways. Now, you may be asking, what about async? Well, you may not, but I do. And that's why I've written Prometheus Async, which supports async I.O. and Twisted, and does the right thing with deferreds and coroutines. And because I'm bad at math, I did not re-implement the metric logic, but instead I simply wrapped the metrics from the official client, and that's all there is. This allows you to use the official client in async I.O. applications. Now it comes also with a few goodies, so let me call them out. It has an AIO GTP based metrics exporter that is much more flexible and configurable than the one that comes with the official client. And you can start it in a separate thread, which means it's useful with any Python 3 application out there. You do not have to use it with async IO applications. I personally use it with my pyramid apps. It's just, I just need the configurability. Then it also includes auto-registration with a console agent, which is because we use console, but service discovery is kept uh, completely generic, so whatever you use, you just have to write two functions to integrate it with your favorite ones. So it basically means you just say in your own code, uh, start metrics endpoint and register it, and as soon as your metrics are up, console will know about it. And console is very well integrated with Prometheus, so it's very little over, overload once or overhead for you to get this working once you've put the pieces in place. So time is running out, um, but everything is instrumented, so let's wrap up really fast. And what did I promise? I promised prediction. If you have good dashboards, if you use predict linear, linear 
or the even better hold winters, which allows you to apply a smoothing factor that will favor older or newer, depending how we set it, uh, values, you're just fine. Alerting, there's alert manager. There's a very powerful way to interact with it, and it integrates with almost everything. And then there's the holistic overview. So, and if you instrument widely, you will have the data. Everything. You can build dashboards, you can play with PromQL. You have everything you need if the thesis hit the fan. And this is not theoretical. Last week, we had a really big emergency, operational op emergency in our company, which was not our fault. We ran into a very obscure bug that only happens on obscure platforms, <coughs> FreeBSD. And um, so while the operational staff, I'm more on the developer side, was busy trying to contain the fire, I've built a dashboard for them. So we could immediately see, we try this, what happens? Oh, load is still rising. Let's try something different. This is very useful if you don't have to just keep uh, pressing uptime or uh, staring at the top. I believe I've covered everything. So I hope you're eager to measure all the things. Please study the talk page, as always. Uh, it contains all the links, all the projects. Follow me on Twitter. Get your domains from Vero Media, and I'm not taking questions because I'm really bad at understanding questions on stage. But if you have any questions, I'm out there. I'm here until Sunday. Just come and chat me up. Thank you. Thank you.